When one studies the truth of God's Word, there are certain demands that it makes on us. This morning I would like to study one of those demands that truth makes on us. And that is that the truth demands a good conscience. I would like to begin with Acts 8 and verse 1. And it's only a partial reading, and we take note of that, and we'll deal with it in a moment. Acts 8 verse 1 reads, And Saul was consenting unto his death. Well, if you don't know the context, then you might ask, whose death? And of course, that's the faithful and great servant of God, the first Christian martyr, Stephen. And who was it that was consenting to his death? And that was Saul of Tarsus, who would later become the peerless apostle Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles. Was there a greater man in all the Bible than Saul of Tarsus following his conversion to Christ and great and faithful service as an apostle of Christ? I dare say there was not. Later in the book of Acts, Luke, the inspired historian of that book, tells us this. And Paul, looking steadfastly on the council, said, Brethren, I have lived in all good conscience until this day. Acts 23 and verse 1. Now the thinking person and the diligent Bible student will wonder maybe if they haven't studied this earlier about what he said in Acts 8, 1 and then what Luke records Paul said in Acts 23, 1. So let's study this for a moment concerning the truth and what it demands on us today, the study being a good conscience. You need to note carefully that while Saul was giving consent to the death of Stephen, that he was doing so in all good conscience. That's because he thought he was doing right. Now the question arises, well, did he sin? Did he break God's law? For sin is the transgression of the law, 1 John 3, 4. Well, the answer is a simple yes. Indeed he did. At times, we sin when we act in good conscience. And there's a reason for that, because we do not have the correct information or the right standard for making a proper decision. If you look at what the evidence is in the New Testament concerning Saul while he was a sinner, Saul didn't understand. He didn't know. He did not believe that Jesus Christ of Nazareth was the only begotten Son of God. He believed him to be simply a blasphemer and imposter, and all those that were his disciples were the same. He was doing the best he could to uphold the standard of right that he thought was God's will. But he didn't understand that when Christ died on the cross, that that law of Moses was nailed to the cross and taken out of the way, Colossians 2, verses 14 through 17. Paul said that he thought he ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, and he said that he did those things, Acts 26, verses 9 through 10. He further said that he had... Uh, caused people to be arrested, that he had caused them to be put into prison, and he had even given his vote to put people to death, as the case of Stephen, Acts 26.10. He says that he oftentimes in all the synagogues pursued them, to arrest them, to punish them. He wanted to make them blaspheme, which means to speak against Christ as the Messiah, to deny Him. He even says of himself that he was exceedingly mad against them. 
He persecuted them even unto foreign cities. In other words, it wasn't just enough to destroy it. That is Christianity out of Jerusalem, Judea, and Galilee. But wherever he could find it, and he was looking for it. Acts 26 and 11. However, his culminating sin was that of consenting to the death of Stephen, a truly great and faithful servant of God. I might pause here and say parenthetically that a great deal of preaching that needs to be done today, that the culture and times demand that it be done, even in the church, is not being done. But if you want to see what I'm talking about, go read Acts chapter 7. And you'll see what some people who travel under the banner of gospel preacher have not incorporated into their work as they say they preach the whole counsel of God. Acts 7, 51 through 53, 55 and 56, and 59 and 60. Now, going back, leaving our thoughts set in beside, we see that this constitutes absolute proof. I say again, absolute proof. That it's possible for one's conscience to urge a person to do what is wrong because that person believes it is right. So it was then with Saul of Tarsus before he became a Christian and an apostle, of course, of Jesus Christ. So it was while he was still believing that Jesus was not the Son of God, but that he was an imposter and claimed to be Son of God, that he did these things. Now, it should be clear that your conscience, a man's conscience, a woman's conscience, tells us to do what we believe tells us to do what we, underscore it, believe is the right thing. But it does not tell us what the right thing is. I hear some people saying, well, the conscience needs educating. The Bible presentation of what your conscience is does not mean that you can educate it. It's your intellect where the rational part of you exists, where information is received and considered and thought about, conclusions are drawn, that's what needs to be educated. All a person's conscience ever does is say, feel real good, you're living according to the standard that you believe to be right. Feel bad, you violated that standard. It says nothing about the standard. It says nothing about the standard. That's why that Saul of Tarsus could be exceedingly mad against Christ and his church and have a good conscience because he was living up to the standard he thought was God's will as he persecuted the church. There are many important things in our lives such as treating others right, such as prayer that we engage in, our Bible study and all of the acts of worship and so on through all that's involved in being faithful in our daily lives, faithful to God. But none of these will fit together in the total picture of what God requires of us unless we do these things with a good conscience. I cannot overly emphasize that. Nothing is more important than acting in harmony with one's conscience. So that's why I want us to study this very important matter and study it carefully and personally. So I say, as Jesus once said, take heed what you hear. Make sure it's God's Word and take heed how you hear it. Honestly, apply it to your life. Because you're not going to become a Christian and you're not going to remain faithful unless you have a good conscience. But there's more to it even than that, as we shall see. So we ask the question, what is a good conscience? Well, the conscience is that within man which urges him to act 
in harmony with what he believes is right. I mentioned that earlier. I say again, but the conscience does not function to tell one what is right. I don't care what Jiminy Cricket says in Pinocchio. The conscience is God-given. You didn't make your conscience. You see, when you consider what the inward man, the real you, really is, the spirit, then you have to consider it the way the creator of that spirit, the father of our spirits, revealed it. And without going in detail about the conscience, the Bible teaches us that the inward man is conscience and will and intellect and emotions. Conscience, will, intellect, and emotions. That's the best way you can see what you, the real you, is. Now, keeping that in mind, you see then that God gave it in the creation of you. You can harden it so that it doesn't function anymore as God intended and that it must if we're to serve Him faithfully. You do that by constantly resisting what you believe to be right. You can even have a wrong standard, but if you don't live up to it, you're searing your conscience. You're hardening your heart. So you are doing what you believe to be wrong. But you're doing it anyway. You see, there's two different things here. The conscience is the supreme court of your being. It says, feel very good, you've done what you know was right. Feel very bad, you violated it. But what is the standard? What is the standard? I'll just look again at Saul of Tarsus. Before and after his conversion. That's why he could say, I've lived in all good conscience before God until this day. Yet that covered the time when he persecuted the church. Let me say here, and I may mention it again. When a person is acting according to the wrong standard, but he believes it's right, and his conscience says, feel good, you're keeping it, as Saul of Tarsus once did. Then when he's confronted with the real standard of conduct, the true one, he faces a dilemma. And he's going to satisfy it one of two ways. He will either change the false standard to the true one and keep his good conscience. That's what Saul of Tarsus did. Or he will keep now that which he knows to be false and he will no longer have a good conscience. I pause here to interject this regarding the Bible's place and what is called modern parlance and has for many years psychology if those who would really want to study psychology would study the mind of God who created us and comments on us then they would have a great step up on everybody else in understanding who we really are and how we really function what goes on in the mind but they don't like so many in the scientific world, they are all caught up in no God, secularism, and evolution, and we're just a bunch of hairless improved apes. And who knows whether the human race will ever exist if time goes on, and there's no reason to think time will go on. There's no God, and there's no judgment. When you're dead, you're just gone back to dust, and you cease to exist. And that's the view of a great many people in this world. But if psychologists really knew their creator and thus know the creation man, how he's put together, they would have a complete different viewpoint of why men get so tore up over a great many things that it brings about all sorts of emotional and psychological imbalance. Now, if you never listen to anything else in your life, I hope you'll listen to this. You cannot go to heaven if you live in violation of your conscience and die in that condition. A man 
sins, breaks God's law, 1 John 3, 4, if he does not do what he believes is right. People sin when they do what they believe is wrong. And they also sin when they do not do what they are convinced they should do. If one's conviction is, for instance, that a certain action is obligatory, it's imperative, must be done, can't be dispensed with, then that person realizes that one must do that to be pleasing, in this case, in our study, to God. And his conscience will urge him, will urge him to do it. If a certain action is forbidden, then that person's not going to do it. Thus, he will be acting in harmony with his conscience. So you see, the conscience sits there and says, feel good, you lived up to the standard, feel bad, you violated it, but what about the standard? We're in the business as the church of preaching the gospel to every creature and contending for the faith of saying, here is the real standard, New Testament Christianity. Now you better look at what standard guides you, no matter how well your conscience is working and how well you're living up to that standard. But I would be afraid of a person that says, here is a standard that I believe governs all men. It's wrong, but I believe it's right, but I don't live up to it myself. What's that person done to his conscience? Before he ever hears the gospel, what's he done to his conscience? He's already started searing it because he won't live up to it. He doesn't live as God put him together. He's stopping that mechanism called conscience from saying, feel good because you lived up to the standard, even if the standards are wrong. Or feel bad you violated it, even if the standard is wrong. That's just the way we put together. One is to have a standard that's wrong. That's sinful. But the other messes with yourself. It's tinkering with the engine. It's not letting your human mechanism as God made you function as God intended. It'll blind you to a great many things because you won't live up to whatever standard you have, whether it's right or wrong. And that causes things to malfunction. The timing gear goes wacky to do. And it won't work right. There are a lot of people like that. So that when you preach the pure gospel to them and they listen to it, they don't pay a lot of attention to it because they're already not living in harmony with the standard they believe is right. And their conscience is not working right. They've seared it. It can't work right. This is what we do to ourselves. This is not being honest with ourselves. This is not living up to whatever standard we have. And so we're making it harder when the truth of the gospel comes to us. We're making it harder to believe it. Because we haven't been living up to whatever standard we believe was right in the first place, even if it was wrong. As very young children, we start out with a perfect conscience. Everybody has a good conscience until he violates it. If he always acted in harmony with our, if we did, uh, with our convictions, then our consciences would always be good. But the Bible talks about other kinds of consciences, such as the, as I've already mentioned, Paul's writing to Timothy, the seared conscience, 1 Timothy 4 and verse 2. Now let me talk about that. We've all burned ourselves where there was a blister, and we talk about dead skin. Why do we call it dead? It doesn't feel anything anymore. We have calluses on our hands. And you can pick them. You can even trim them with a knife. They won't hurt you. Because the sensation to feel is not there. You can do that to your soul, brethren. Just have a standard that you say, that's the standard I ought to live by. And then they'll live by it in time you sear the conscience. So let's talk about other kinds of conscience. 
I want to emphasize just what I said, the seared conscience. The conscience of a person who's acted against his conscience, that is what he believes is right, and he's done this to the point to where he doesn't feel anything anymore. Doing what one believes is wrong burns, it sears that conscience. Well, I already understood that. You said that two or three times different ways. There's a reason for that. I want us to let it sink in as to the importance of the matter. This is how you harden your heart against the truth. This is how you will, as a creation of God, abuse yourself, and you won't function anymore as God intended you to function. Not going quite as far as the seared conscience is what the Bible calls the defiled conscience. Paul used the defiled conscience in 1 Corinthians 8, 7. Paul used it to the young preacher Titus in Titus chapter 1, verse 15. We can defile our consciences by doing one single solitary act which you believe is not right. It'll bother you. So an evil conscience encompasses both of those that we just mentioned. A weak conscience is one that has been violated enough that it's difficult for the person to do right. You see... If you're going to get over to modern terminology, you talk about psychology, an emotional problem. Can you see where some come from? But you go to the psychologist today, you got all the modern terms of psychology, which don't exist in the Bible, just like you don't have biology and uh, zoological terms and so forth in the Bible, but principles are there and they're the list. And you see that if we would consult our Creator's revelation to understand ourselves, He will deal with your inward man. He will deal with your mind. The mind is a part of your spirit. Now don't ask me how the spirit is connected to the physical, the metaphysical to the physical. But it is. I dwell in this body. This body will go back to dust, and I will return to God who gave me. It'll still be me. You will still be you. What I do here in relationship to God and His truth is going to form a character in me that I will have with me when I leave this world. If you don't believe it, I refer you again to Luke chapter 16 to the rich man and Lazarus. When you get that picture of the Hadean world, there's nothing physical about it. There's nothing secular there. There's nothing material there. But Abraham is still Abraham. Lazarus is still Lazarus. The rich man is still the rich man. And so is everybody else, whether in paradise or torment. And all you have to do is just read about the lost rich man. And his rebelliousness to God's word that he created here and thus destroyed his conscience is working quite well even as he's tormented for his rebelliousness and the sin he died in. The word of God was insufficient. He wanted extra beyond the word. He wanted some help in that place of torment. He never had been obedient to God. And he wasn't obedient there, even though he's being punished for his disobedience. And I want to say every time I read that, some people never learn. Now go with me to what we'll call conscience as described in Romans 2.15. I'll read Romans 12.12-16. 12, 12 through 16. American Standard Version. For as many as have sinned without the law shall also perish without the law. And as many as have sinned under the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. 
For when Gentiles have not the law, do by nature the things of the law, these, not having the law, are the law unto themselves. In that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness therewith, and their thoughts one with another, accusing or else excusing them. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men, according to my gospel by Jesus Christ. Now Romans 2 and verse 15 relates the conscience to two other things. It's illustrated by Paul in this passage. On one side of conscience is our conviction. Sometimes we need to ask ourselves a question. Am I convicted about anything? What are my convictions in life? Especially pertaining to right and wrong, moral and spiritual matters. Or do I just roll with the punches on anything? The only thing being when it comes to getting my way. Now that's another story. A lot of folks have convictions about that. But some people don't even realize what they're doing is trying to make everything function around them and their will. They have never figured that out. Therefore, they can't figure out why they're in misery. Because it just doesn't work that way. If you want to drive yourself, quote, quote, crazy, whatever crazy means, just try to make the world center around you. Because there's other people out there with wills. And they don't necessarily want to center around you. Because they're all busy trying to get you to send around them. <laughs> of course, you put that in a marriage, and I need not say any more. So on one side of conscience is our conviction, that which we believe is right. The passage refers then to the beliefs of the Gentiles, the non-Jews who lived before the New Testament age. Now, another pattern for us in our day would be little children to go to school. Wherever they go to school, their teacher instructs them. There's teaching done at home. They live and uh, they study various kinds of books. Uh, as a result, as we all have, we develop viewpoints. And those viewpoints develop into convictions, beliefs. And they say to themselves, this is right or this is wrong. You Bible school teachers ought to keep that in mind when you've got those little kids in there. It's exactly what they're doing. They come into this world just a blank print and everything begins to stick. Everything. Mamas and daddies, regardless of what goes anywhere else, that's what's happening. So we ask, what's the conscience itself? Well, the Word explains itself. Conscience indicates a knower dash with, a knower, K-N-O-W-E-R, knower with. It's that within each one of us which urges us to act in harmony with what we believe to be right. Well, can you go further than that? I don't know how to, how to do that. It's sort of like saying um, God's without beginning or ending. I can accept the fact of it, but I, I can't grasp it. Whatever one believes to be right in any situation, that's what he ought to do. That's why there's the sense of oughtness within you that a thing ought to be this way or it ought not be that way. That's partly how we're made in the image of God and the stamp of deity upon our very spirits. So that's what you must do if you're to please your God. Now the next point, is our own evaluation of an action after it's done. Thoughts in this passage are those reflection in the mind when one asks, did I honor my conscience in that action? Did I really act in harmony with what I am convicted to be God's will for my life? Did I act in harmony with what my conscience urged me to do? Now you understand 
what a mouthful Paul said when he made the statement, I have lived in all good conscience before God to this day. Well, let's look at some misunderstandings, some misunderstandings. Some people say the conscience is not a safe guide. Well, is it correct to say this? Well, no. I hope already what we said would say that. One should always follow his conscience, even when what he believes is wrong, though he does not yet realize he's wrong. I put it this way sometimes to people. Don't change because you like me, because we're good friends. Change because of the truth I teach or somebody else teaches that convinces you that what you now believe is wrong. Now change, and change for that reason. And I simply say, remember Paul. The conscience is a safe guide as far as it goes in the sense of ascertaining what action we should follow at any given moment. Follow your conscience. But if we know that we're not doing something that our conscience rejects, then we know that we're sinning, even if the thing we're doing is right. You don't violate your conscience, in other words. You live up to what you think is right. Now, you're always trying to make sure what you think is right is right. And that means going to God's Word and studying the Scriptures. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 is saying that. But you always live up to what you believe is right. If you don't, you'll zap yourself. <laughs> you'll mess the whole engine up. You'll sear your conscience. You'll harden your heart. Neither is it proper to affirm, although it's often done, that the conscience is, as I said earlier, and I'm emphasizing again, is a creature of education. Your beliefs are creatures of education. And your belief is formed, even in godly things, by the Word of God. That is, the information is there to properly enlighten you. If your knowledge is wrong about God and godly things, your faith can't be right because faith comes by hearing the Word of God. So you want to keep your conscience working right, live up to the standard, but you want to check the Word of God to make sure your standard is right. And thus, judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. That includes judging yourself, too. How do you know whether you need to obey the gospel or not? If you can't objectively judge yourself to see you're in sin, then judge yourself to make sure you know the gospel, that it's the power of God to save, that you know the plan of salvation, that you must hear the gospel from it, form your belief, keep the commandment to repent of your sin, confess your faith in the Christ, and then... Be obedient, complete your obedience by being baptized in Christ for your sins. Why do you know that? Well, Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. That's why. But I've got to keep my conscience. And I want to keep living up to whatever the standard is that I believe to be right till the truth of God's Word says standard is wrong. And I'll continue to keep my conscience right because I'll just change my error into right as the Bible defines the right because I can repent. I can will myself to turn from a wrong way and I can keep my good conscience. Many people think conscience is the sole criterion of conduct and that's one of the points we want to dispel today. It's not true that the conscience is all that is involved. It is not the sole standard for being right with God. The truth must be connected with it for anybody to be able to become a Christian, to live faithful to Christ and His church, and to go to heaven. It's Jesus who said, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. But it can't make you free if you have messed your conscience up because you just simply have seared it, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, the seed of the kingdom, can't prick it to where you feel it. And so some people sit there, they intellectually process what's said, and it says you're a sinner, and if you die now, you go to hell, but they're dead on a doornail as far as it bothers them. You can't reach them with the gospel anymore. They're just like that old callus. You can pick it all you want to, and you'll never feel a thing. They're dead skin as far as the Word of God's concerned. So it's not enough just to have done the right thing. For example, we must be acting in harmony with our conscience. 
Because you can know right now as a Christian what the right thing is concerning worship and your daily living. You don't have to just be outside the church not keeping a good conscience toward the plan of salvation. You can be in the church and develop a bad conscience. That's how there could be a falling away. That's the only way there could be a falling away. Because you can't fall from what you from where you're not. And that's what Paul said to Timothy. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. That in latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Now, who was that? People never heard the gospel? Atheists? Pagans? These are members of the church. They seared their conscience. And so we say, take heed, brethren, lest we fall. We read of the works of the flesh, Galatians 5, 19 through 21. And there through Paul, the Holy Spirit warns that everyone who lives engaged in such works will not go to heaven. They'll be lost forevermore in the devil's hell. And there are many people who do not like for preachers to speak what I just said. They don't like to be troubled. They need to be troubled. They're headed for perdition forever. Something's got to shake them out of it. However, no man can be a faithful gospel preacher and not preach that kind of sermon. And no Christian can be faithful if they're not dealing with their brethren in the same way. I don't know why we think it's just the preacher's problem. It's every member of the church's problem. Elders in particular elders, and every member of the church. So we must study the Bible and not just say, well, I'm, I'm a daily Bible reader. You can read the Bible all day long. That's a start. That's a start. But you can read without studying. So you've got to study it. You've got to prove all things. Hold fast that which is good, First Thessalonians 5.21. The Lord's church today is being torn apart at the seams from one end to the other because people have not loved, they have not studied they haven't obeyed the Bible. I say again, most of the New Testament's written to members of the church, not to those outside of it. Does that imply anything to us? You, you, you can't just go to heaven by accident. You go to heaven because you want to. You deliberately put all things in line with the truth of God, and then your conscience says, feel good. So we must have this before us, and we make a final plea can we not see that understanding conscience is sorely needed in the world today and in the church today? It's sorely needed even among God's people. It should be our goal in life to have a conscience void of offense, as Paul says in Acts 24, 16. And one thing that comes out of this is to further uphold the great Apostle Paul and what a servant of God he was when he could say, after all those years, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. If you're not a child of God, we beg of you to obey the gospel as we studied it this morning. If you are a child of God and you sin, we urge you to honestly evaluate yourself. Repent of your sins, confess them, and pray God for forgiveness. Take advantage of this opportunity and do so now while we stand and sing.